doesn't matter the name above the door or the person who picks the team, really, as long as Newcastle are winning and heading in the right direction. Geordie Journals back at the Brandlin in Gosforth. Dom Skur here, joined as ever by Liam Kennedy to discuss, well, to have a bit of a catch up about Newcastle United because yeah. it's a free week in terms of after Brentford, the hangover from that, now looking ahead to Leicester City. Myself and Jordan will be at Eddie Howe's press conference at the Newcastle United Media Centre on Friday morning, but Liam, you were keen to have a chat about Newcastle and have a bit of a catch up yeah. on what has been a I say a quiet week, but it's been quite a newsy week for the club. Yeah, I think it's been quite topical. Uh, there's been lots of little bits going on, a lot of a lot of chatter on social media. I'm just sort of looking around this room. You might know us. It's it's beautifully festive here at the Brandon Arms. So yes. we're, we're hosts again on the Jordan. Very Journals. accommodating. They are very accommodating. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's probably a good little time. It's been a, a free week in terms of in terms of games. Didn't have that last week. Won't have it next week either. No. So it feels like a good time to get an extra video out. Um, talking about the issues, and I think the ones that we're going to come on to, are they've they've stroked up some strong opinions, I would say, on social media. Um, Callum Wilson, Sandro Tonali, mm-hmm. and the manager himself, which has been one of those debates that's raged on since the disappointments of that last half hour at Brentford last week. Yeah. We've given it a little bit of time, very deliberately. Yeah, because I think everybody can be reactionary and emotional, and and I think sometimes it's it's important to look at the bigger picture, contextualise, mm-hmm. and come at it from a different angle. So we're going to talk, firstly, as you said about Callum Wilson, mm-hmm. and then we'll come on to some other topics, like I say Eddie Howe and the situation at Newcastle United with Sandro Tonali a little bit later on. Yeah, Callum Wilson's big one this week. He was just getting back fit again. He'd played, came off the bench the past couple of games as well. It's only about an hour's worth of football he's played now in the past six or so months since since May. He'd been out injured. And then, as we feared, he's broken down again. Hamstring injury out till early 2025, potentially even longer. With Callum Wilson, you can never quite judge it because... We thought he'd be back early this season with his uh, previous back slash hamstring injury. And then he's only just come back now. So, yeah, it's another blow for Callum Wilson. It's, I mean, countless injury blows over the past past year. He's, or throughout his Newcastle career, really, he's only started two games. And you feel for him, but it puts Newcastle again back to square one in terms of the striker situation. For me, it's two very different things. I think you've got to split them into two and I've seen both sides of the argument from everybody on social media and I'm, I agree with both sides of it. What I would say is um, I think Callum Wilson does not as a professional footballer want to be injured. No. He does. He wants to be playing games, he wants to be scoring goals. I don't think you can doubt his commitment to getting back fit. We've heard from people in and around the, the, the scene at St James's Park who've talked about the efforts and the, the the commitment that Wilson has shown to get to where he is now. I think, as we've mentioned on this, this show many a time before, the lad's body's failing him. And it doesn't help he's missed so much football that he, these are the type of injuries you get when you're trying to get back at yeah. an intensity that he's trying to get back at. So not for one second do I uh, question the person. Uh, Callum Wilson, I think he's been an excellent striker to a point for Newcastle United. And if, if Callum Wilson is fit, then he is... He is a very good Premier League striker still and will score goals. But that's ultimately been the problem. You know, missed so many games. Can't ever rely on him to be fit. Just at a point Mm. when you think, as you said, you're getting that balance where you can start bringing him on to impact games. He didn't impact on the weekend. He hasn't impacted when he's came on so far. But, you know, it's having that extra option, which they've lacked. Um, The split in that is, I think football's a ruthless business. It has to be. If, If it's not, then it doesn't drive progress. Yeah. And I think you've got to look at what Callum Wilson has uh, achieved in the past and say, brilliant, he's done He's done it in the past when Newcastle needed him. Probably his goal has almost saved them from relegation battles at times. Definitely. But you've got to look at it now and say, is he contributing to the squad? And the answer is no. So it's a very cold process for me and you say, he doesn't belong in the squad anymore. Mm. If he can't play games and provide 
for the team, for the squad. It's It's got to be ruthless and you've got to say it's game over. So that's the two different parts to it to me. Yeah. Is that I've seen some people almost fly off a handle with it and go, oh God, he's a disc- he's a disgrace. No. It's not that. I don't doubt the man. He w- he doesn't want to be missing football matches. Yeah. His body is letting him down. It's not his mentality. That's a very different thing. If he was if he was calling sick and he was oh, oh I'm a kind of player of the day, it's not mm. that. He's you're getting genuine injuries. Yeah. But it also has to be are you producing you're a striker who's on good money? Yes. Are you producing goals? No. Are you even playing games? No. Right. We well, are not providing for the squad. Mm. So for me, that's an easy decision to make. Yeah. And I don't really I don't really care about the the money side of things. Obviously the accountants out there might well care about the money side of things. But what is this football going to be football club becoming? Because everyone talks about, well nobody wants them, you can't sell this, you can't we can't get rid of Every other football club manages to sell players. Mm. Oh, well, you could maybe give them another year to, to then make some money. Look, if we go down this route with every player at the football club, they're going to all end up retiring here. Yeah. You're going to have Trippier, with, Wilson, with no Almiron. You're not going to make any money anyway. Sometimes you've just got to roll the dice and take less than you want. Just get them off the books and move on and hope and back your own. Uh, you, the things you can control which is making sure that your scouting's absolute top notch back and mm. Paul Mitchell to go and find a gem like the things you control take control yep. and back that and take a risk and say you know what we wanted it's probably come to the point oh, we wanted five or six million for Almiron but if we get his wages off the books then you know we'll maybe spend that somewhere else and do the same yep. with Wilson it's not a problem I don't think the football club should be in this constant hamster wheel of give him another year Oh, I might be able to sell him, give him another year. It's just, to me, that's not progress. That's just sitting still and standing still. It doesn't it doesn't get you anywhere. So it's, it's. I've loved Callum Wilson. Like, I think he's wore the number nine with pride. Um, I, I really liked him as a centre forward. You know me, I like, I like, I like physical when I play football, getting stuck in, uh, like shoulders, headers, like, I, I, I Wilson. He ruffles defenders. At his best, he's a... It's nu- quite old school, isn't he? He's, oh, he is. I love it. He's a nuisance. But sadly, if, he, if if we're not seeing that on the football pitch anymore, it's got to be game over. Yeah. But the knock-on impact of Callum Wilson being injured as well is Alexander Isak as well. The injuries he's picked up from playing games and play, having to play through 90 minutes, 90 minutes, over and over again. And then he's broken down. And then the lack of... Faith in Willisula to come in, so then Anthony Gordon, you're having to drag him. It's a it's a snowball effect if Callum Wilson is injured, and we saw that in the opening months of the season and the back end of last what, season what is as Willisula? well. Like it's a question Project that striker everyone is, has got to ask. The label. A lot of people are asking out there, what what is Willisula? What what was the point in spending, you know, uh, ten to fifteen million pounds on a player who isn't available? It was the same. Well, he's available. Sorry, it isn't used in the thoughts. So. There was a lot of the arguments about Lewis Hall last year to the same degree, and he was much more expensive. Um, the Hall one felt like possibly less of a risk. I don't think it ever felt like the Asula one. Asula hasn't really produced at Premier League level before. Um, at or least, championship. No, at least uh, at least Hall had done it in a very small sample size, six or seven games probably for yeah. Chelsea. And was younger as well. He was younger. 18 when he signed. And I think I've seen clubs sign players... Uh, in similar price brackets who are scoring goals in the Premier League now I mean I don't think Man City would have sold Delap to Newcastle United but they only paid 20 for exactly, him yeah. and, and, and he's a lad who looks ready probably a lad who's going to be knocking on the England door um, mm. in six months time such as his level I mean Willis is not going to be knocking on the England door but I don't think he's going to be knocking on the Denmark door either mm. by not playing games in the Premier League and not having scored in the Premier League so it's all a very stra- it's a very strange one and I hope that we're sitting in a year's time going was another masterstroke you know to ease him in and give him a little bit of time at the end of the yeah. season I hope we are saying that the early signs to me aren't massively promising but I, I, I'll be honest with you I probably would have said similar things Lewis Hall Lewis Hall was different you watched him play and you looked and said look there's a technical footballer he's a good footballer he just didn't look like he could defend as a left back. Yeah. He needed to learn the basics of defending, which he's obviously gone away, worked hard at, and looks much, much better. Isn't mm-hmm. perfect, but looks much better. Will Asula maybe has to do a little bit of that. Um, perfect to learn similar size, stature of Alexander Isak. 
but that doesn't help the problem that you're talking about. It doesn't. If he's not ready, Newcastle need a ready-made striker. Mm. They need somebody else to come in and boost the team and score goals and provide competition. Alexander Isak doesn't have any competition. I think competition fires something in players. And it's mm. all a bit easy at the minute for some of them that they know they're going to be selected no matter yeah. what. Um, that doesn't really push a team forward. There has to be more. Um, we're going to see that. I think we're going to see that for the next few weeks. I think he's going to make changes. It's a very hectic period. There's a lot of games in a very short space of time. Mm-hmm. But I just don't think we're going to see. We're not going to see. We might have seen Callum Wilson start ahead of Isak at times, or maybe it's the two of them. We're not going to see Willisula do the same. The Bromley game was probably an ideal game for Wilson to start, or now it might even be a Willisula game. But you would have expected Wilson to get in the team at some point. But I think the point I wanted to make, which goes back to your needing to be ruthless, and it's very easy to say in hindsight. And I reckon if you asked any of us. At the end of the season, Newcastle came fourth. Should Newcastle sell Callum Wilson? We would have all said no. But Newcastle, looking from a business point of view, a PSR point of view, you look at a player who's 31 years old, which he was at the time, just scored 18 goals. He's got a year left on his contract. What do you do with him? Do you cash in, maybe recoup all the money you spent on him, and then you can go out and get a a younger backup striker to Alexander Isak, who at that stage was really sort of coming into his own and then started the, the next season really well, ended up scoring 25 goals. Do you do that, cash in while you can? And I, I get it's easy to say in hindsight, but no, they offer him a new contract. And that's sort of the ruthlessness we need from Newcastle. And look, I'm sort of rewriting history slightly because at the time I definitely thought Newcastle should keep um, Callum Wilson and offer him a new contract. Is but since then... You, there's a defence for your opinion in my opinion you didn't you didn't know the balance sheets yeah. so any person out there who I think most people watching this probably would have had your opinion yeah. as I did yeah. and said well no I would keep them yeah because the quality of striker compared to how much you'd have to pay which is something Eddie Howe said but you go right 31 year old 12 months left on his contract just scored 18 Premier League goals we could sell him for 20 million yeah. and people would take him because he was fit towards the back end of the season and okay we couldn't have predicted he would be pretty much injured ever since then but Newcastle need to go right we've got a 31 year old in form not long left on his contract he probably although he's dedicated to Newcastle he would probably be open to leaving and becoming the main man because you go look we've spent 63 million pound on a striker he's going to be the main man next season and he's obviously a lot younger as well but instead the to offer him a new deal and it, it's just sort of not worked out for anyone. So what you need is you need people to lead from the very top. So they seen the balance sheets. They knew that coming down the line, sales had to be made. So difficult decisions had to be made. What they did was didn't make any decisions until they absolutely had to in mm. the last minute, which is actually in many ways because they had all of the information. It's all right as a fan or as a journalist, us going, that bloke's done really well. I wouldn't, I wouldn't sell him. To be good sellers, you've got to see opportunities, and that was a big opportunity. Very much so, go back to, to what my comments would have been around the Trippier one, when Bayern Munich were offering more than £10 million for Kieran Trippier. Yeah, you if you roll back the clock, you had to sell then. I wouldn't have, but I'm not, I haven't got all the information. Yeah, I'm only saying that from a playing perspective and what I thought it would have probably done for uh, the feel of the season, you know, when we're trying to progress. Yeah. But if you look at it from cold hard facts, it should have been conversations happening going, we have to, this has to happen. He's a high earner, we'll recoup all the money we spent on him. He hasn't got an awfully long time left on his contract. He's, what, 34, or will be 34 later in the year as it was. I think that's another one. In hindsight, easy to say, but with all that information, and then knowing how close Newcastle came to breaching PSR, exactly. it's actually like, it's quite reckless that Newcastle I think so. weren't I, doing those sort of things. I think it's mad that they continued down that path. And that brings in the, d- the dynamic of what the football club was then compared to what it is now. Look, I don't really know the dynamics. I think everyone's still working out what the dynamics are at the football club mm-hmm. with the changes. It's been quite a um, turbulent year in that respect. Mm-hmm. Go roll on the clock back. Amanda, me and dad, very close to proceedings, uh, very close to Eddie Howe. Eddie Howe, a lot of control. There should have been people above that cutting things out and saying, this football club has to be run like a business. It can't be run like a, an old pal's social club. I'll keep him, I'll keep him, I'll keep him all. Because it was, it was always known. Eddie Howe might not have known all of this information, by the way. Mm. I would think he would. 
But Ashworth was there, he would have known all of the information. He was having regular meetings with Eddie Howe. I spoke to them both about that mm. um, at the training ground. So you'd think they knew, but that should have been taken out of Eddie Howe's hands. Ask any manager, do you want to keep a player who's you know done X, Y, and Z? He's never going to say no. It's also the same one that Eddie Howe isn't really to blame in terms of the money spent on transfers. If you ask any manager, do you want another player? Yeah. They're never going to say no. Yeah. It's not it's not their decision to say, right, there's the line. It's 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 the line at Newcastle's had to be so hard because they allowed it to get there. Yeah. How did you allow it to get there? I hear people might even come in these comments and go, I know, but we had to spend money to get away from relegation. Okay, well yeah, that was right. And they spent a lot of money to get away from relegation. Then they spent money again, which got them into the Champions League. But then they spent money again that is taking them nowhere. And that's where the big problem is. They had to stop spending all that money and had to sell. Mm. And the only really significant sales up to that point was Alan St. Maximin, which wasn't really a significant sale when you think about no. it. Well, there was an, another sale, Chris Wood as well. Yeah, Chris Wood. But Wood's again, sorry. lost money. What, something that I thought was interesting, John Joe Shelby, his sale, there was some quotes from John Joe Shelby recently about Eddie Howe actually wanted to keep him even though he was injured and, him, and, and had barely played. John Joe Shelby said, I had to plead with Eddie Howe to let me let me go, even though he wasn't really in the first team pitch at the time. He'd, he'd started maybe one game in the Cup that season. And yeah, Eddie Howe still wanted to keep John Joe Shelby. And, yeah. and that's sort of almost the mindset of, of the manager and the club in some ways, where there is that sentimentality, it's the familiarity. I know what you'll give me. I know your personality. I'm happy to keep you as long as I can. Well, there is a bit of that. There's got to be a bit of that because you're talking about chemistry and squad dynamics and building a squad, not just a team. But I think what they've probably neglected over the last few years is the idea of building a squad. They've they've essentially looked to massively improve a team with 30 million plus players on a consistent basis. When they've known all along that the football club was not making enough money to sustain that kind of business, yeah. that's where it comes down to me that they're all part of this. So Howe's inability to let go, Shelby said it, he's doing the, He's done the same with Wilson, he's done the same with other players as well, his inability to let go. If he's given all the information and still has that approach, then he's massively part of the problem. If he isn't exactly on it with the numbers, what was going to have to happen in the next windows, etc., if he wasn't given that information, you can't really put any blame on, like I said, any football manager. Do you want another player? Do you want to keep him and, I, and add another one? Yeah. I'd rather do yeah. that. I'd rather have more options than, than not enough. Yeah. But we know the football club now, clearly the way it's acting, because we haven't seen all the numbers again yet. I'm sure mm. that'll come in the next month or two. Sure will. Um, but the football club, the people at the top knew the football club wasn't making enough money to sustain the approach. And that's where it comes down to, and he took a lot of criticism for it. But I said at the time, he was right, that it was unsustainable. Paul Mitchell said it's unsustainable yeah. in roundabout terms. Whether he used that term, whether he didn't, whatever it was, he basically said going out signing ready-made footballers is not how this business model has to work. If you're not selling, yes, proven players as well. The only way it works is if you're Brighton and you're selling a hundred million pound or a fifty million pound or whatever, then recouping money that you spend. And, and I don't really want Newcastle to become Brighton, but I think they've got to do a little bit more of that. Mm. They've got to do a little bit more of that. They've got to go and find some gems. The value isn't in already signing fifty million pound players who don't improve. I think Harvey Barnes is probably going to become one of the the poster boys for that field approach, in my opinion. That you sign a player for best part of forty million who in a position is young, you've got depth in is young, but not not young young. He's not Anthony Gordon. Yeah. Where you sign him for a similar price and still had a lot of room to grow, was still in the 21s. You're talking about a lad in his mid-20s who's now closer to 30 than he was, well, you know, getting towards 30. Yeah, he's 26 now, yeah. So, is he? I thought he was 27. Oh, he's just turned 27. 27, now. yeah, he's 27. He's not closer to 30 than he is, uh, but, but he's getting there, you know yeah. what I mean? Now, you start to lose the idea of somebody signs him and think, well, we've probably only got a couple more years of him. And I don't think they get that money back from him. Your Cass United are not really in a position, looking at their financial model as we know it, to be signing players that they're going to lose money on. They said that from the start, they have to get it absolutely right. And I think what they didn't get right is coming home to roost now. And it's going to be this idea uh, that fans out there, that sort of go, is it, you know, the next window, oh, it'll be fine. It really isn't going to be fine. Because it's just rolling on from window to window that Newcastle United are making more money every time and it's having a marginal difference. They're able to spend a little bit, but they're not able to go and sign these 
players that the seemingly the manager and so far we don't know if the sporting director favours doesn't sound like he does they're not able to go and sign Sandro Tonali's every window and, and really I go back to the very start of this takeover process and it was almost like uh, PCP who were, were given the reins largely talked in depth I can't remember if it was ever on the record but it was definitely off the record and I'm not giving anything away here they talked the idea about we spend £50 million pounds every every window and I remember hearing that at the time thinking that's not going to change the Cass United in anything mm. significant we knew how under um, under sourced the, the, the squad was at the time it needed yeah. major surgery and it got a decent amount of surgery they needed it but then they, they walked so far they just carried on at that level and the way I what I kind of use an analogy is it's a bit like you get your wages tomorrow on Friday and you decide to live like a king over Christmas yeah some of you might do that out there I think a lot of people <laughs> might end up doing that but you live like a king for two weeks right. you spend every penny you're in here you're in the Brandlin every <laughs> night having a few few jaws eating out every single night takeaways don't really care and then all of a sudden, you're two for the final two weeks of the pay, you're living on beans on toast. You've got <laughs> nothing. <laughs> you haven't to sell the new telly that you just bought from Currys. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't to sell it to buy another one. It's it's just it's the idea that they've been they've had a lot of money to spend, have went and spent it, but they've done it in, in a short period and then they're skinned for the rest of it because of the way the model works. That's not even I'm not even gonna go on to whether I think the model works or not. The, the rules at the moment, sorry, I think I think they are they are a sham. I think they're anti-competitive in every way, shape, or form. Yeah. But they are the rules, and they're the same rules for everybody. Yeah. They are weighted towards teams who make more money. You don't. You, yeah. You don't act in a certain way and then kick your toys out the, or throw your toys out the pram. Yeah. For not adhering to rules that were in place. Or already there. Yeah. Largely, I mean, they yeah. have been yes. altered. So that's, but that, that's fine. You can throw your toys out the pram for things like that. But PSR. It's really come to the forefront, and Newcastle going to transfer windows very much knowing the boundaries of, of PSR and where they stand. Dan Ashworth throughout his time at Newcastle, he said that we have to trade, we have to trade, we have to be a good selling football club. They didn't sell anybody. Hmm. They didn't really sell anybody. I think the idea when they spent this kind of the big money on big players was was, I mean, it can only have been. I don't know this for a fact. It can only have been that they maybe thought they would flip one on. Like, it would be such an overwhelming success that a Manchester City would come in, bang £100 million down for Alexander Isak, bang £100 million for Bruno, something, one of those players would go, and it would allow them to sign another full of a certain level, and the squad, would, the, the bottom would be rising up in the squad, mm. and you would keep developing, and then there'd be another one in two years' time. That's probably, until you make astronomic sums of money, it's probably the only way a football club can start to compete. Yeah. It's not right. I look at Aston Villa, I look down at the Midlands and see what they're having to do. A team that's going to automatically qualify for, for the next round of the Champions League. They've been a credit to English football in that competition. Having to sell, I think Douglas Luiz was their, was arguably their best player last season. He was like their Bruno one in, in some And they way. had to sell him to, to even think. But Newcastle didn't do that when they went to the Champions League. It almost makes you look and say... They, they spent money. Yeah, they, they went and spent money and got rid of St Maxim and that was it. And rolled the dice on it and... And I think they've probably, in that respect, rolled the dice too much. They, they went. They, they must have been relying on a sale. They've got to have been because the model looks so flawed. The the club looks crippled, totally um, tied with its hands and legs behind its back. Is that mm. possible? Yeah, definitely possible. <laughs> not comfortable. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, are we? We're not comfortable <laughs> with it at all. No, but then on the same sort of talking point. In the summer, Newcastle were more than willing to go out and spend a lot of money, potentially break their club transfer record and sign Mark Gay. It looks now, though, very much that that money wasn't readily available. If they went, and, if they'd went and spent that money, it looks like the sales were became a necessity. Whereas now, sales aren't a necessity mm. because they're just rolling along with the same players. They don't have to sell anybody. Whereas it looked like then they they would have had to. It, the pressure would have came on straight away, and if they hadn't sold in January. It would have been the summer, mm. which brings into question that approach even more. You knew, you knew that by Ju the end of June you had to make, and it looks like a significant amount of money. It's about seventy million. Newcastle it? United were in no way, shape, or form in a position to be turning down good bids for Kieran Trippier, if there was ever one for Wilson. But there was definitely interest. 
they, were, they weren't really in a position to do it. So why could that not have been communicated? There, there was a communication at the start of the window which did nothing but scaremonger in many ways. I think they could have been clearer. Yeah. I think they, they, they kind of told me what the situation was in a roundabout way. But what they should have said, they could easily have come out and said was, this is the situation. And if we sell players, it's for this reason, because we need to satisfy these stupid rules. That, yeah. They could have just come out and said that. Mm -hmm. And I think people would have been more prepared. Yeah. But they didn't. It was all very cloak and dagger. Beating around the bush. Yeah, I thought so. And look, there might be some business sense in that. Are you really going to say he has a for sale sign? Yeah. They, they During did, the transfer. They window. did that anyway. <laughs> Do you not think they, they, did, bit, they, yeah. they did that anyway? So you may as well have just been honest. That's not a massive criticism. There's theory behind it, but it's it's a it's a difficult situation where they find themselves in, and it's difficult for fans out there because ultimately we look at it as journalists, and this vote, this team needs refreshed. Now oh, Eddie Howe said himself, it's... risk becoming stale, and that's something echoed by by ourselves. Even before Eddie Howe said it, Alan Shearer has now come out and yeah. said it. There is a, a staleness creeping in, and he needs three players. At least, you know, the squad needs. It's looking in a position that it was a few years ago, with a different ceiling and a diff sorry, a different uh, level. Yeah. So Newcastle were fighting at the bottom, and they needed refresh. Then they've hit a point now where they're not going to go anywhere. They've kind of they've moved up ten places ish, you know, on average in the league, hmm. and they're just there. They're not going to go any higher. They, until they actually refresh. haven't though, because the twelfth no. in the moment. Yeah. The last season before the takeover, yeah. they finished one. They did. That's a different argument altogether, which yeah. I'm sure we'll come yeah. on to. Yeah. That's your progress argument. Yes. Yes. But if Newcastle finish there, you look, £400 million spent and you're no further forward in the table. Look, I think serious questions would have to be asked. Serious questions of... of uh, from top to bottom, from really. to That's exactly it. So, uh, starting with the players, they, they absolutely carry a lot of the responsibility. But I think it feeds into the manager and the coaches uh, that have to take a lot of responsibility because... Ultimately, it isn't a player going to be um, cost his job if if things don't go the way that people want. I don't necessarily think that's going to be the case at all. Um, there seems to be an element of patience uh, around the football club, which probably isn't a bad thing uh, in some respects. But there has to be an accountability. I think the people at the top have got to look themselves in the mirror. And there's a few new faces in and around there who hopefully bring different expertise. and. Yeah and different thinking and strategy, which it needs. Um, but the people who've run the football club at this point have to look themselves in the mirror and say, did we do everything correct? Okay, we were pushing for progress and spending every single penny we possibly could to a point. They've said that on the record themselves. Yeah. But that didn't work because now you find yourself in a corner that you can't get out of and everybody else is sitting waiting. You, we, we know Pep Guardiola loves uh, Bruno Guimaraes, I just I said you don't think they're monitoring this situation, thinking, but well, they're going to have to. Mm. Going, what, the, don't think they're going to come in and say, oh Newcastle want 100 million for him. There you are, 100 million. Why would you? You're going to look at it and say, we're unlocking the door for them, so we'll give you 60 and test the water. And I don't yeah. think it's going to be an easy process. It might be the case that some of these players and the figures that have labelled on them don't make the money that you think you do because they've put themselves in a corner. Yeah. The way you get out of the corner, though, Dom, is by not being so loyal that you, you keep players beyond their sell-by date. Mm. Now, I think they could play. Some of them, like Kieran Trippier, look, I think there's an argument to say he comes back into the team. Uh, I think he's an experienced head who's got a good um, output. And I think in a lot of his time at right-back, he's been a playmaker at right-back. Um, look, I think he's lost a yard here or there and he'd probably admit that himself yeah. and the back end of last season wasn't really a great time for him at the football club but still he's a player he's a player who can cross a ball gets double figures in assists the last two seasons from, from right back incredible it's good considering a, he was in and out of the team last season due a key to injury. point a key point in the team though they used to look for him all the time always look for him and it would be the triangles yeah but is, does that not go back to the staleness argument? Teams maybe found that out last season I to a degree, did, yeah. and then it's like, do we try? Kevin Trippier may not be at the club yeah. much longer. He's, he's getting on now. He's thirty-four. He's still under contract for next season, though. But the player who the club will realistically look to sell, do you still try and play that way, or do you try and find a way for Tino Livermento to function in the team, who's very much? the future and the successor at Viper. Well, what, what I think we've seen a little transition is towards is, is 
that sort of playmaking right hand sides flip to yeah. the left yeah. because the balance is different. So you had Burn and Trippier where nothing came on the left and a lot came on the right. To now, it's not the same dynamic because Livermento is a natural right back, but is, is an athletic, quick uh, player who likes the ball at his feet and spaces to run into. Mm. Has to improve his output, but is still a young lad who can improve. Um, but very different to Trippier. And then on the other side, you've got a very technical left back in in uh, Lewis Hall, who has the ability to produce assists. Mm. Probably hasn't as much as you'd hope, but he's got goals and assists in his game. Mm. If Newcastle can get him involved in the, as much as they can, as high up the park as possible. So yeah. the dynamics probably switch. He's a young player. Kieran Trippier was walking into the team as England's fullback. Um, having you know played in the Champions League, a, a fantastic career yeah. uh, at good football clubs, was able to just wander in, and, and I, I still think to this day him and Bruno Guimaraes are, are the two tran- really transformative signings. The impact they immediately had on the football team, mm. um, and both leaders in their own right. Although some people would debate that, I think I think Newcastle just have to get ruthless, and it ties into that that Callum Wilson debate that the football club will go no further if it keeps the same approach they have to change things up it doesn't mean doesn't necessarily even mean having to get rid of one of those players they need to roll the dice with somebody they need to find there will be somebody out there who will take other players in this squad Newcastle United the way people go on seems to be the only football club incapable of getting rid of footballers every other football club yeah. is able to do it so I don't believe nobody wants any of Newcastle's players I don't believe it I think it's impossible I just think it's like a something that an excuse that people seem to, to bring about there are mm. people who will want Newcastle's footballers but you've also got to make it worth a while so it might be a case is you drop the price on a couple of people and mm. roll, roll them out the door with the hope that you further progress yeah brings on to one who Sandro Tonali this week yeah it was interesting I, I'll do the I'll do the T's and C's first okay go think? on then yes so obviously do like comment share subscribe etc for all your Jolly Journals content we do love the conversation. Get involved. Uh, drop a message in the comments if you've got anything to say about whatever we've talked about so far or whatever we're going to talk about, and we'll always endeavour to answer it. But we do have some proud sponsors of all Geordie Journal's content. And first one, shout out Mitigate. Mitigate transforms workplace he- mental health, mitigating legal risks, reducing absenteeism, and boosting productivity. Delivering up to £9 ROI per £1 invested. Book your free demo a day. That's Mitigate. That's a, a proud sponsor of Joy Journals. Pr- another proud sponsor of the Joy Journals who have been with us since the very start. Of course, is Four Rivers Financial Planning. Do go to Four Rivers Financial Planning for all of your holistic uh, financial and pension advice. All the details of both of those uh, sponsors are down below. So just check them out for any of those needs, anything you want. Spot on. Sandro Tonali. He's a player who, he was the marquee signing after Newcastle qualified for the Champions League. You expect big things from him. He comes into the midfield, maybe signed as a number six. We've very rarely seen him there. Okay, he was he was banned for 10 months. But hasn't really found a home in the Newcastle start at 11. We thought he did. Yeah. And then he drops out this team. Will he come back in against Leicester at the weekend? You'd like to think so, but... There's been a bit of trepidation from Eddie Howe in terms of starting Sandro Tonali. And then reports emerged this week from Italy. We spoke about them last night. You, you take Italian reports with a pinch of salt because the very the push club agendas rather than the facts. Really. Yes, yes. That's the best way to put it. A lot of the newspapers and websites over there are... Uh, vehicles for the football clubs to express interest, agents, that kind of thing, and it's great. It makes for great headlines and, mm. and good for fans over there. But like you said, it's it's take with a pinch of salt. I, I put the Italian uh, football press very much akin with Portugal and Turkey in terms of if you see stories, we have the as journalists, you have those radars, don't you? It's like right, yeah. As soon as you see it come from somewhere, it's like mm. yeah. Certain publications in Spain, no. Yeah, <laughs> there's some some good players have been linked to Newcastle yes. over the years from outlets who would have no real idea that Newcastle were going to sign these players and have yeah. the signed. So yeah, Sandro Tonali, unhappy in Newcastle, going back to Italy or wants to go back to Italy. You're calling the calling rubbish on that. 
what I would say is, I try to always put a human perspective on it, as I did with Callum Wilson, the lad doesn't want to get injured, I'll put a human perspective on the Sandro Tonali thing. Would it be out of realms of all possibility that the lad wasn't disappointed with what's happening to Cassian so far? Not at all. I think if I was him, uh, even if I was, even if, you know, the complexity of the betting thing, it wasn't a very good start. That first year was a bit of a nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, and then probably coming back thinking, right, I'm firing, I'm ready to go. Hasn't really had a run in the team. Hasn't been trusted by the manager to get a run in the team. Yeah. If I was him, would I be sitting here saying, I, I tell you what, this has been the best move of my career? No. Not at all. No. I wouldn't be saying that at all. So did it come as a surprise that there was murmurings? No, I wouldn't be surprised if the lad was disappointed with what happened so far. He's moved away from the, the football club. He was he was loved. He was at home. Huge club as well. Massive, massive football club. Um, and a, a huge degree of prominence that he has within uh, the national team, all that kind of thing, to basically a lot of the time be a fill-in man in a midfield that wasn't functioning. It, it's, it's, I wouldn't be happy if I was him. But also, I think it was key to really focus in on what the agent said. The agent was unequivocal in what he said and it was the right thing to do even if the player does feel a little bit I'm not saying he does I'm just saying is it possible he could feel disappointed yes but the agent came out and said look the lads the lads being loved there and they've been loyal to him so he's going to be loyal to Newcastle United as well do I think it's out of all realms of possibility that Sandro Tonali does go back to Italy no I don't he's a very sellable asset if you're, if you're being very cynical I'm not sure they've got the money does no, Italian, Italian football clubs, have the money no. anymore? So, you know, is he... But if, if a club came in, Italian club, Juventus, for example, came in 40 million for Sandro Tonali, do you entertain I, I, that? Do I, you I, end I, that conversation? I, I don't know because I don't know the, the PSR implications. It's again, it's one for the accountants, isn't it? Like, does it unlock doors for you elsewhere? Eddie, four, are you, yeah. you going to play? I know we do, actually. <laughs> Where's Charlie when you need him? Are we going to have a... Look... Eddie, are you going to play him? Are you going to play him? Are you going to get the work, your money's worth out of him? If he has any doubt, then you say, well, he's, he is potentially for sale if somebody puts the money forward. Yeah. I, I, I really want to see him get a run of games. I was dead disappointed to see him not on the team at Brentford, whatever the reason may be, because I think Eddie Howe has striven for, that's not even a word, strove, stri stri strived, strived <laughs> for answers in that uh, midfield department. And it felt like he might have found an answer uh, from that Sandro Liverpool Tenori. game. Back to back games played really well, in my opinion. I just wanted to see him get 10 games. I, I want to see him get 10 games in the team. I want to be able, after 10 games, to either say, that's what he is and that's what you're going to get, whether it's in an eight or a six or wherever he is, that's Sandro Tonali and that's what we get from him. I don't think anybody with any degree of certainty can say that at the moment. He's a very good player, very technical. Uh, Looks reasonably strong. He's got a, he's got a quick, good good he is. He's good with his recovery runs. Speedy, um, tenacious in many ways. I want to see the lad get ten games. I want to be able to say in mid January, either I love him or I can see why he didn't play him. Or I want to be able to make a decision myself. Eddie Howe sees him every day in training. There's reasons why he hasn't been playing him. Whatever those reasons may be, but. I want to see that, and I think most Newcastle fans out there feel the same. They want to see the player, a player that was brought in to huge fanfare, that was they made a big song and dance about signing him. They paid a lot of money for him, and mm. the, the fans have stuck by him. They want to see him now, and I think that's only how play the man and give him a chance, give him ten games, because otherwise we're never going to find out. And I tell you what, if he doesn't give him ten games. It'll be a different conversation, and we might in eight weeks' time, twelve weeks' time, have the agent dropping hints in. Well, actually, maybe he's not very happy. Yeah. So I think it's there's a little window on this. I think Howe has to trust the lad. And look, he was out a long time. There's got to be reasons why he hasn't been picked. But the signs that I saw, Crystal Palace, he was the best of a bad bunch. He was probably Newcastle's best player that day with Dan Byrne. And then he followed that up with a really good performance against Liverpool. I just want more. It just with Tenali, it's always just left you wanting more. Yeah, and and I think it's the down now is the time. Yeah, definitely because we've seen, like you say, we've seen glimpses of Sandro Tenali. We know there's a good player in there, yeah. but like you say, it's there's a bit of an identity crisis with Tenali. What is he in Newcastle's team? And Eddie Howe needs to to find those answers because Sandro Tenali, I mean, he functions perfectly well for Italy as a. As a number eight, sort of on the left of the midfield, he's 
shown in small sample size, but two games for Newcastle is a number six. He's perfectly capable. Yeah. So, I mean, Eddie Howe did say Sandro Tonali had, had cramp, so didn't start the Brentford game. But do you drop your best player? If he's fit enough to get on the bench, do you drop your best player from the last two games in a game where it's possibly the one of the easier ones on, on paper anyway? Well, he wasn't, in terms he clearly of wasn't Brentford. injured though, was he? If he was injured, he wouldn't have been on the bench. No. Fatigued, tired. Well, go and give us an hour, son. Go and give us an hour. You know, go and give us your best hour that you've given us. Right. Um, you're, you're in this team now. This is your opportunity. How injured are you? How hurt are you? Is it an influence from outside of that? Is it somebody saying you can't play this lad because of the underlying numbers that they might have from the, all the monitoring they do in training? Well, it could the, be f- that. the physical output for the Liverpool game, Eddie Howe told me this, was the highest of any this season for, for Newcastle as a team. So that was the most that way, yeah. the most running they'd done. And I, th- I, I don't think that gets on a, a bit of a tangent, but it's not a coincidence that when Newcastle run the furthest, it's their best performing games. Spurs was another one. Arsenal. Those games, okay, it's to do with opposition a lot of the time. But if you run far, you work hard, you tend to get the results more often than not. Yeah. It's just, it is the season. It's, it's, it's so Leicester this weekend? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what we're going to get. That's the problem. Yeah. Neither, neither does Eddie Howe. But I kind of want to... Like part of this video I mentioned to you off here, I want to put the record straight on a few things. Well, one thing in particular. Yeah, because our video after the Brentford game, you were quite critical of Eddie Howe and his players and the team. And some people didn't didn't quite yeah I think l- like it or get what you, the point. So you I were think people to make. are picking up on a general theme, and people have probably picked up on me in particular as a general theme. And a lot of people reach out to me with Twitter and whatever it was in our comments as well, saying you you're anti Eddie Howe. I had a lot of that anti Eddie Howe. I think that's a big statement. I think it's a big statement for anybody to say anti Eddie Howe, and it's a very easy answer for me. I am not anti Eddie Howe. I'm not anti-Eddie Howe, never will be. However, what I will say is it's it, the work that he's produced, I can be critical of. Pep, Pep Guardiola could be the casting manager now, and if they're on a run, like Manchester City, <laughs> for example, you'd be critical of his work without being anti the manager. It's actually possible. And I think that's one thing that people can't uh, divorce from the two. They can't if you have a criticism of the team or whatever it may be it might be a general criticism and the theme of it this season has generally been critical and that is because Newcastle United aren't as good as they were the season before so you've set a bar and standards and they've actually not hit that bar as often as they have in previous seasons Mm. so naturally the theme is going to be more critical and I think it's come on to Eddie Howe a few times whether it be from his changes whether it be from uh, selections whether it be from uh, just general malaise in certain games and not in others and Mm. attitude as Jordan's touched on a few times in the press conferences so I would say that one thing I want to put straight is I I am not anti Eddie Howe I've said this on this video before and I'll say it again I don't really care who the manager in Newcastle United is. Mm. I don't really care who owns the football club. For me, I just want Newcastle United to do well. And if that means criticising a player, a manager, an owner, and director, whatever, I actually think that's, it, that's the only way you get progress, is by holding people to account and apportioning responsibility. Mm. And I think really, most of the time with the team, a manager holds a lot of that responsibility. So mm. naturally, it, it goes on to them. But... I don't care who the manager of Newcastle United is. That again, don't take that as me saying I don't want Eddie Howe. That isn't it. It could be anybody. It doesn't matter the name above the door or the person who picks the team. Really, as long as Newcastle United are winning and heading in the right direction. And if they're not winning and heading in the right direction, I'll ask questions of that naturally. Whoever it is, what's your thoughts on? Because it, it's a polarizing debate. And I, for me, I point with the finger, and I know you're you're in support of this as well. That. People seem so keen to label. Yeah, I think that that's that's the my main issue, if you could call it that, with it, is 
it's almost like you can't be critical of Eddie Howe without being labelled right, you're anti Eddie Howe, as people put it in your case, or you can't be supportive of Eddie Howe without going, ah, oh, happy clapper. Yeah, yeah, happy clapper. <laughs> it, it, people, it's silly. It, it is silly, and our job with these videos is, as journalists is a lot more nuanced than that, I like to think. We say it how we see it sometimes. Sometimes it is reactive because yeah. we're commenting on a game that we've just seen. Yeah. But then also you, you're judging trends in 2024. There's been recurring trends. It hasn't been good enough at times. And it's our job to, to ask those questions, to be critical at times. But I've been called taking it personal with Eddie Howe, but I don't think it's, Have you? it's ever been. Wanting you yeah, seen. someone commented saying, I made it personal by Eddie, Eddie Howe's um, doesn't want to make changes and he, he's been ignorant to it. Almost they were but, suggesting you were saying he wasn't putting any effort in, weren't you? Yes, that wasn't yeah, it, yeah he's, he's not making effort to make changes. There is no harder working manager that I've personally seen than Eddie Howe, but I think Eddie Howe is quite set in his ways in terms of he knows how he wants his team to play and he will make tweaks to that, but he is so confident that the way he wants his team to play will work that there's a natural reluctance to deviate from that and that's probably the point I was trying to make and yeah there's never anything personal there and I just think the perception I think social media is the main problem which is such a I was speaking about it last night actually it's such a small portion of the fan base if you go to St James's Park and get everyone to put their hand up whether they're pro or anti Eddie Howe I'd say the vast majority would would be pro Eddie Howe, if you want to put labels on it. But if Newcastle go and get beat by Leicester at the weekend, then it's probably more 50-50. It's very reactionary and, and keen to put labels. And that's put what labels. football is. Yeah. It's like, why, why, do people, why do people like seem so keen to move away from essentially what largely drives a lot of opinions? It is reactionary. You are reacting to what you've just seen, and that's a lot of our videos are that. <laughs> this one isn't. This one is taking a bit of time, thinking about it. We had a couple of things we wanted to go off our chest about certain topics, and let's give her the chance to do it. Let me know what you think in the comments. If you agree, if you don't. No, it's just a Geordie Journal's pub catch up, isn't it, really? And one thing you'll always get with us is it it never comes from a bad place. So the idea of agendas, you've got agendas against this, agendas against that, just isn't a thing with us. Like, our only agenda is wanting Newcastle United to win football matches. <laughs> don't you dare accuse me of having an agenda. <laughs> I never, I never would. I never would, Don. Sometimes. <laughs> if, if you know where that's from. Yeah. <laughs> Friend of the channel. Friend of the channel. Right. So, I think that's everything off my chest. Is that everything yeah, off your yeah, chest? Yeah, yeah. I'm, right. I'm happy. Mitigate, down below. Four Rivers, down below. Do check them out. Like, comment, share, subscribe. And do keep an eye out on Geordie Journals because there will be a full press conference review from Eddie Howe tomorrow and of course we will have a live from the Leicester City game on Saturday do tune in for that one if you like that kind of thing that's just with myself and then there'll be all three of us with Jordan who isn't here today will be involved in Saturday's video so do keep an eye out stay tuned click the bell from your Geordie Journals good night <laughs>